Morning all, let's have a look at another amazing game from the Sinkfield Cup, played on the 13th of September 2013. Gata Kamsky was playing white against Magnus Carlsen. He kicked off with e4. I thought it would be nice to take Magnus's perspective. He's the man of the moment and is heading for a world championship match this year against Vichy Anand. So let's see, what, did he, what would he play against e4? Well, e5 is his preferred choice, classically occupying the center. After knight f3, knight c6, we have the Royal Lopez. After a6, now Gatskamsky chooses the exchange variation with bishop takes c6. So bishop takes c6. Uh, this was once used to beat Capablanca, Lasca. There's a classic game, Lasca against Capablanca, which showed the real power of bishop takes c6. Uh, so let's see, bishop a4 is by far the most popular move on live book, 47, over 47,000 games. So bishop takes c6 is actually the second most popular, 6,703, quite a, a dramatic fall there. Bishop going back has actually been seen 40 times as well as a surprise weapon. But these are the two main moves, either moving the bishop to a4 or taking on c6. So let's follow this through now. This is now very, very theoretical. After castles, there are numerous ways for black to support the e5 pawn. Um, in fact, the most popular move, which is f6, is played by Magnus, 2174. Another way to support e5 is with queen d6. 1182 games. You can pin the knight, 915 games. You can play bishop d6, 377, or you can ignore it with knight e7, that's interesting, with 278, queen f6 with 252. So anyway, the most popular move is f6, d4 is the most popular reply now. Uh, it's a bit passive to play d3, so this is by far the most popular idea, even though uh, this exchange on c6, white now pouncing on that d4. Before you know, black gets a lock on d4, it's nice to break that center with d4. Now, there are two main moves here. Magnus's move is bishop g4 here, actually pinning the knight. But the most popular is actually taking, just taking on d4. 13, 14 games in my live book. This is uh, 811, what Magnus played. Okay, and now d takes e5. And this leads into the queen's becoming uh, exchanged off. It's uh, impossible for f takes e. You know, queen takes, then knight takes e5. Uh, is on the card. So queen takes d1, rook takes d1, f takes e5. And now uh, the most popular move here for white is rook d3, and that's, that is what is played. There's another alternative in knight bd2, 112 games, but rook d3, 287. Okay, bishop d6 to protect e5 now, because that unpinning was actually threatening knight e5. <clears throat> now knight bd2, so the rook is in front of the knight there. So, <clears throat> pardon me, croaky throat. So here, black played knight f6. Now we see knight c4. These are all the main moves still. Castles offering e5 here. And you might think this is quite curious. Why is e5 being offered? Um, it's the most popular move is to take with the knight, 38 games. Taking with this knight, four games, there's a big difference which way you take the knights here. So taking with the f knight and bishop e2. The idea is bishop e2 and it looks quite dangerous, this skewer, and there's pressure potentially on f2. Rook e3, by far the most popular move. So all beaten territory at move 13. Okay. Now bishop takes c4, knight takes c4, and here, nostalgically, in this position, um, if you remember on this channel, we had Garry Kasparov, when he was about 12 years old, playing Mikhail Tal in their very first encounter. And Mikhail Tal chose to move bishop c5, and the game rapidly ended in a draw. I can put a video link for that game if you're interested at this point in the video. Um, you to check that game out as well. But um, so Mikhail Tal's choice was bishop c5 here. But Magnus, uh, that is the most popular move, bishop c5, with 27 games in live book. Magnus's move, much rarer bird, with only three games, knight g4. 
Okay, so it seems to be quite aggressive though on f2 and h2. We see rook e2. And now let's come out of that. We're ending our theoretical analysis of the opening there. And let's put on a kibitzer. In here, black regained the pawn with bishop takes h2. Okay, just one more final say though. In this position, um, only a handful of games, only like two games with the move king h1 and there were no games before with what was played. So king h1 is safe enough in this position. For some reason uh, Gata varied, innovated with king f1. The engines actually prefer king h1. Uh, you know f2 is not on here, the king's pressing on the h2 bishop. So we can't uh, do anything too bad to white here. This is equal. But king f1 is played instead. So what are the key differences here of king f1? Is the king going to be useful in the end game? Steinitz says the king is a strong piece. Use it. Well, okay. Let's see. But is it a bit of a liability? Rook a e8 is played now. Okay. So here we see now knight d2. Rook d8, and it looks as though already black, believe it or not, is slightly better. I mean, we're talking nearly half a pawn here from an engine point of view. What is going on? Let's just rewind that for a sec. In this position, what? Why is this better for for black here? Is this knight d2 a bit of a poxy move or something? What is black actually threatening here? Um, maybe you know white's potentially threatening knight a5 because the suggestion is for b6. Okay, can white just not play something like a4? Is a4 terrible? What would happen here? Say rook e6, c3. Can we gang up on this pawn, for example? Well, in this position, actually, white has a strong move, just just blocking the bishop that you can try and uh, get this position, and. This is going to be okay for white. Trying to trap this bishop. This sort of position is okay. It's it's good. It's all right for white. But we're here we see after knight d2. Um, you know the importance of the theoretical debate is evidenced there. Why is black better after rook d8? There's a lot of pressure. The rooks are blasting down. If you just look at the rooks, these kind of seem passive. Okay, we have structural damage for white to, to look forward to exploiting in the future. But before the end game, the gods have made the middle game, as they say. So we see f3 here. And of course, that pawn's pinned, you know, it's not actually threatening. So the king's on f1, not on h1. So it can be ignored. Bishop g3. Is black actually threatening anything significant here? It seems just a very nice position at the moment. We see King G1, so the knight is moving now. It is threatened. Knight E5. So there's a dark square grip. There's a lovely knight on E5, and the rooks look nice. Is this all short-term compensation for the structural damage? Can White get the pieces out? Well, he plays B3. It seems logical to get the bishop out. Okay. And now we see Knight G6. Now knight f1, so maybe white is kind of slowly untangling here, it seems. Or is he? There's now bishop e5 attacking the rook. Couldn't he have just done bishop b2? Let's have a look. Is there big problems with bishop b2? Yes, there is a big problem in knight f4. This is just impossible. We're losing <laughs> the knight on d2, so this is miserable. So this is why knight f f1 just protect the f4 square for the moment but now instead of going into f4 magnus has moved bishop e5 attacking the rook so okay can the rook not just move here with rook b1 or is it really too dangerous for rook d1 in fact the engines give this as the best move rook b1 don't do anything too rest drastic allow this horrible pin with rook d1 we can unpin with king f2 check this is an example continuation knight e3 knight f4 is there a concrete threat here from black yes attacking the rook of course 
rook e1 and black can actually forcibly win a pawn like this but will this be enough to win this might have been one of the better continuations because here okay it doesn't look too great uh, for white actually this is an outside past pawn um, the chances are with black but maybe it's holdable but in the game we see remarkably uh, Gatta even at move 21 he has to give up a pawn with c3 his opening cannot be classed surely as a success here having to give up this pawn now something has just gone horribly wrong in this game I think the issue started already they already started with that move king f1 instead of king h1 it made things a bit more difficult to untangle so he's having to give up a pawn here so what's the compensation it is taken bishop b2 and now this can be ignored we have this knight f4 attacking the rook instead of moving the bishop rook c2 okay it's lovely to be a pawn up bishop a5 and this knight's pretty good on f4 as well what an ideal position to have with the black pieces knight g3 okay the knight's got an intent maybe of knight f5 that's stamped out with g6 rook f1 now we see okay what is white doing here or what is black doing rather he plays actually the move rook d3 which controls certain squares like c3 potentially you can imagine if this bishop drops back to c1 then maybe bishop c3 here let's have a quick look at that bishop c1 maybe not not an easy maybe just check it's okay but the rook does prepare at least you know maybe it's it's preparing to double it looks like a powerful move on general principles okay just preparing maybe to just double the rooks king h2 and now instead of doubling the rooks actually Magnus puts his bishop now against this king move on b4 I think this king is is quite dangerous on this diagonal of the bishop maybe you can use d6 coming up knight e2 knight drops back knight c1 evicting the rook rook goes back to d7 so let's assess this position black a pawn up some structural damage yes controlling the d-file knight's beautifully centralized the bishop's got this diagonal which can be useful as well it doesn't have to be on b6 it's not that irrelevant in this position okay we see g3 the rooks double sealing that control for the moment of the d-file king g2 and then this brings his king up king f7 and then we see the move f4 which might be uh, potentially weakening white a little bit and you might think well hang on is rook d2 any good here Max doesn't have to rush if rook d2 let me just rook f2 and that, that's okay I mean it's not much worse than this position so Max actually plays h5 is there a positional threat here well actually knight c5 might be quite dangerous just on the e4 pawn we see king h3 now a5 so slowly trying to improve the position king just goes back for a moment now knight c5 so is this pawn really going to be forced forward pawns are going to get more and more fixed if it's forced forward or is there some other disaster as well if e5 was played if e5 knight e4 black is actually significantly better now with the huge threat of rook d2 without any rook f2 so that that can't be actually played it seems king f3 is played instead but now rook um, d2 does seem dangerous it's not played though knight d3 is played which is also another strong move as well so rook e2 and actually in this position it seems there is a very very strong move the engines are crying out for here just taking the bishop let's have a quick look this wasn't played just taking the bishop for bishop a3 a powerful forcing move it seems and now rook d2 this position is absolutely miserable for white if takes has to take the king 
takes we can end up winning the A2 pawn by force. So this this is a forceful continuation just to get this position. Is this enough to win? Uh, someone once said all rook and pawn endings are drawn. This looks unlikely to draw with white actually. Looks as though there's too much pressure. But let's see. Magnus doesn't he doesn't play um knight takes b2. It does look very nice and forcing. He plays bishop e7. And now white takes, rook takes check, king g2. Bishop goes to c5 now. So again, this rook d2 is made a little bit more effective than rook f2. Rook c1, and now rook d2. The rooks come into that seventh rank. White defends the second rank from his perspective. Rook takes, rook takes, rook d3. So still, black's better. But it's a little bit more simplified. Is there any risk of a draw here? Rook c2. Bishop goes to d6. Is there a concrete threat associated with this? Maybe potentially undermining with h4 is on the cards. Uh, possibly. Or maybe rook e3. Okay. Uh, that might be uh, not not really uh, such a problem. Let's have a look. Bishop c1 is played though. Bishop e7. King f2. Now Magnus plays a4. He's trying to cause some structural damage on White's queen side. He can potentially get this past c pawn. If he can clear away this, this will be a past c pawn. Does White really want to take here? If he takes. Then black can play rook d4, forking both pawns. Say this, rook b2, b6. a5 is probably white's best. It's miserable, but maybe, you know, it's potentially tenable, this sort of uh, position. But uh, in the game, actually, white didn't take on a4. He played rook d2. Maybe trying to avoid the dynamism of that pawn sacrifice. Magnus just takes on d2, bishop takes, takes on b3, takes c5. Can he create a passed pawn? He's got 3 to 1 over here. g4. And he does start using these pawns. b5. g takes, g takes. White still has got this passed h pawn and a potential passed c pawn. Bishop c3. Now we see b4, which looks as though it's a little bit silly in some respect because these two pawns are surely locked down by the one pawn. Or is that the case? Is a clever little trick going to occur here, making use of these double pawns? We see check, king e2, bishop g3 trying to fix white's pawns, immobilize these two past pawns. They are past pawns technically. But here, okay, black's got this pass pawn. Can he do something with this pawn mass? He plays h4, e5. Ah, this might be a significant blunder already, in fact. Ah, let's rewind to f5. Something went horribly downwards here after f5. Maybe there was a technically better move. It's a bad position anyway, like king e3 or bishop e5. It's still a bad position for white. But it seems after f5, Things have gone really, really bad for white technically. So let's see. White now plays e5, which seems promising in some respect that the bishop's like coordinating with the two past pawns. But h3, check. And the king just blocks with king e7 here, not fearing f6, just takes the e6. And even worse now, after king f3, bishop f4, well, this pawn's really dangerous. We see bishop g7. I can't take that because of h2. And now bishop g5 turn a challenge on this diagonal, these pawns. Okay, can white go like for this one, or is, is, is something happening over here? But if king g3, let's have a quick look. c4 is strong here. Forcing this pass pawn, and now bishop f6. We've got a runner over here. The king is overloaded against the pass b pawn, and this king's holding both pawns. So this is this is lost. 
So if we go back to this position after bishop g5, we see bishop e5. And now Magnus does create a passed pawn with sacrificing a pawn, which he can do. They're doubled anyway. c4 takes, he's got his passed b pawn here. And now bishop f6. And we have a situation which is totally winning for white. This king and pawn ending is totally winning these two passed pawns. It's overloading white's pieces. You know, if bishop takes c7, we just push b3. And how is this bishop going to stop this passed pawn queening? What else can white do? If bishop takes, king takes, the king can't get these pawns going. That's end of game. So this pawn is stopping this one, so that there was a use for the double pawns. Okay, so this is just all over, in fact, in this position. Gata had to resign here. So Magnus uh, did better, a lot better than Mikhail Tal did against the very young Gary Kasparov. He chose uh, a variation which gave him lasting pressure. And he ground it out against Gata Kamsky. He seemed to unfortunately have to be a pawn down quite early on in this game. So I think there is the importance of the theoretical debate if um, if that king h1 move had to be played instead of king f1. It seemed black had enormous pressure out of the opening and just managed to convert it, transitioning into this easily won ending. Okay, comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.